So I'm Michael Singer, and um, sorry not to be in front of you in person today, um, but I do want to say quickly before getting going um, that um, I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to Kirsten and the whole organizing committee. This has been a really amazing opportunity to get together and distract ourselves from you know, other aspects of what's going on around us at the moment. Um, to focus on something that's incredibly important uh, looking forward to the future. And I think the the organizing committee has shown a lot of um, grit and uh, resilience in this difficult time. And that that's going to be perhaps one of the sub themes of my talk today. Um, so as I said, I'm Michael Singer. I'm um, a deputy director of the Water Research Institute at Cardiff University and also a senior lecturer in the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences. And today I'm going to talk about um, the global challenges of water security under the influence of climate change. Um, let me just get organized here a bit. Um, so uh, I put this image here on the title slide. Um, some of you may recognize it. Um, it, it was taken during um, the Great Depression. Or actually, sorry, it was taken during the Dust Bowl um, in the West. Um, I obviously have Great Depression on my mind, but um, yeah, this is taken during the Dust Bowl, um, uh, which is a pretty severe climatic event um, that led to a, a complete loss of livelihoods for a huge proportion of uh, the United States of America um, in the earlier part of the 20th century um, and led to mass migration. And it's just in this slide to remind ourselves of the challenges we face um, under climate change with respect to water security. Okay, now I am not in front of you today, um, and that is because we are all um, subject to the whims of this horrible uh, virus, um, which is plaguing our world at the moment. Um, but it is a, a moment to remind ourselves that if we plan well for the future, and we have good systems of management in place that we can vanquish viruses like this and other problems that face us in this world. Um, and in, in contrast, if our planning is poor, um, we may face other fates entirely. Um, there's a term, you know, in perhaps um, podiatry <laughs> um, called flat footedness, and it, it really means what it says that um, as you put your foot on the floor you don't have much of an arch and it makes it challenging to um, be athletic and jump and run and so forth um, but i don't really care about podiatry today what i'm interested in is the third definition in the american heritage dictionary uh, miriam webster is that um, that di that definition that sometimes we are flat-footed otherwise known as not ready or unprepared. Um, and this is chiefly used in this catchphrase of to catch one flat-footed. And um, the, the worrisome thing for me is that climate change is an example of a moment in time that can lead us all um, to be flat-footed uh, and not be planning for the future in the right ways. So my talk is really going to address um, two questions here. Um, when climate change affects the water cycle um, to the extent that it brings about major societal crises, will we be prepared? And what do we do need to do now in order to prepare for impending water-related crises in the future? OK, so let's start with climate change. Um, now, the climate is highly variable. Year to year, we see big, big fluctuations in temperature and precipitation and so forth. And that's what you might call a stationary climate. Um, it varies through time, it varies up and down um, each year according to seasons and years, but ultimately there may be no trend in the, the underlying climate. Um, in, in contrast, climate change refers to a non stationary climate where there are, are systematic trends in some characteristic of that climate system. So um, we're all aware that um, the, car, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions across the globe 
have increased dramatically over recent decades. Um, and notice that there are variations um, in those emissions um, that can be seasonal or annual cycles, but ultimately there is a non-stationarity in that signal. Um, and then when we look at uh, global temperature, um, we can see that in general, um, the global temperature has undergone um, a historical trend um, of increasing through time. And then um, climate models um, that have been run in various um, uh, uh, environments across the globe all seem to corroborate um, a common signal that under the different forcing conditions of greenhouse gas emissions, the temperature will continue to increase um, up in this case up until the year 2050. Um, they made these individual models um, may disagree um, based on the underlying physics that they're driven by or based on the particular emissions pathway that we are on, but they all tend to agree that the climate over the globe is getting warmer. Now, when it comes to precipitation, because we're focused on water in this talk, um, the results are a little bit more equivocal. This graph comes from a paper back in 2011, and it shows the, the based on climate modeling, the expected changes in precipitation over uh, a future horizon of time scale. And what it says to us really clearly is that there are some places that are in cooler colors that seem to uh, express an increase in precipitation and other places that are shown in the warmer colors that seem to suggest some sort of a decline in precipitation over an annual cycle. Okay, so there's a spatial variation in the expression of climate change in precipitation in particular. Now, if we look at one particular location, in this case, India, we can see how that plays out. So on the left side, we see um, an increase in, um, in the temperature over the entire Indian subcontinent that's projected um, under the different emissions pathways. But when it comes to precipitation, there was actually quite a lot of disagreement amongst the models. And then all of this shaded area around the models represents the uncertainty that we have. And what you'll notice from this is the percentage change in precipitation, um, the uncertainty in that signal is much larger than the signal itself. Meaning some areas might see decreases in precipitation and other places might see increases in precipitation, but it's really a hard thing to predict. Now, there are some thermodynamic concepts that are relevant to climate change, because if you warm the atmosphere, that means that you have the ability to hold more water in the atmosphere, um, meaning that if it rains, more water could potentially fall as precipitation. So the climate modeling supports this, of course, because it's based on those underlying physics. As you increase the temperature, the change in precipitation on a daily time scale also increases irrespective of the particular emissions pathway that you might be on. Now, when you play that out over multiple, uh, over annual cycles, let's say, um, it, what it means is that the, the 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 kind of wettest five years of the of the year the five days of the year would be expected to increase and become wetter still so you know 10 15 20 percent wetter than they used to be so that means more of the rainfall will occur during extreme events and then if the, if you think about that spatially in this case looking across the um, continental United States that means that the percentage of land area that is covered by extreme precipitation events will also increase. Um, so this starts to make us think about flooding and the risk of flooding and so forth. But I actually want you to focus on something else, which is the inverse of this. Imagine that the total annual precipitation doesn't change, but we are increasing the intensity of storms um, such that the extreme precipitation events are carrying most of the moisture. 
What that means is there will be longer periods of time in between. Um, in other words, the inverse of that is that we probably will see prolonged dry periods and droughts. Now, I'm quite familiar with um, dry periods and droughts because I hail, well, you could probably tell from my accent, not from um, Cardiff, but from uh, Los Angeles, California. And this is a big metropolitan city in a fairly dry part of the world. Um, but somehow this city has been able to expand to uh, over great distances um, and has been quite successful in doing so. This is a city that's famous perhaps for its swimming pools, for its um, public fountains and public spaces. It's also famous for gorgeous sunsets um, and for kind of wealth and um, extreme luxury in terms of houses and shopping districts. Now, when we think about Los Angeles, it's important to remember the, it, the climatic setting. Los Angeles is a semi-arid city with a mean annual precipitation of 370 millimeters per year, and it has no natural lakes or perennial rivers in its basin. Uh, the annual temperature cycle is one where the maximum, precipitate, maximum temperature never really drops below um, 20 degrees in any month, which is quite striking if you think about the weather that we experience in the UK or, or plenty of other countries. The precipitation in California is delivered as a Mediterranean climate, which means cool, moist winters, not cold, but cool, and then hot, dry summers, where generally speaking, in most parts of um, this LA basin and the surrounding area of Southern California, you don't get any rain in, the, in over this six month period, let's say. Now, even within these dry areas of the country, um, of the state, let's say, um, we somehow managed to sustain a very productive agricultural industry. So uh, for example, uh, over the entire state, most of which is pretty dry, um, the state took in about $50 billion in revenue um, in 2018 alone with more than 400 crops, including a significant uh, proportion of the nation's fruits and nuts. So you might think of this, uh, of California as the breadbasket, as they like to call it, of the United States. Um, but um, as I mentioned, you can get extreme events and you can also get long periods of dryness. And California has seen many droughts in recent decades. Um, one, a short one in the 70s, uh, another one in the late 80s, early 90s, and then another one in the late 2000s. <clears throat> and then a very recent one that was very well documented even in the UK press. Now, when that occurs, you can have um, large scale die off of fruit orchards, um, leading to conflicts perhaps between the agricultural industry um, and the water sector and urban populations that are thirsty. Um, the common refrain from the agricultural industry is food grows where water flows, um, where they're clearly lobbying state government to supply more water and, and secure their water rights over a longer period of time. So California is known for this bear flag, uh, which is a grizzly bear, um, unfortunately now extinct from the state. Um, but, you know, some uh, might actually think of California as being a state of drought, where the camel might be a more fitting animal for the, for the flag. When drought does occur in California, it may, you may think of it as starting in the mountains. So what we tend to see in the mountains is very low snowpack. So this line across the middle here represents the average snowpack for the state. And what you can see is there are particular years like in the 70s, like I mentioned earlier, where the snowpack is very, very low. In this case, down to 25% normal. And then there are other isolated periods, as I mentioned, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, in the 2000s, and then 
the most recent drought where the snowpack actually dropped to 5% of normal. Now that leads to um, ski resorts that have to close because there's just no, uh, no snow to ski on. Um, but more importantly, from a water supply perspective, it means that the water that would normally be released in the springtime under snowmelt conditions, um, you know, recharging um, reservoirs and so on, um, does not really flow. <clears throat> and so um, if we look at, uh, you know, for example, one of the major reservoirs in the state, Folsom Lake, um, you know, this is what it looks like in a normal year, but in a drought year like 2014, the, the thing looked really empty, um, in fact. And it's not just in terms of surface water where this expresses, but if we look at groundwater in this lower graph, <clears throat> this plot represents the progressive loss of groundwater um, or depletion in California's Central Valley where a lot of agriculture um, plays out. So there's this general decline, but what you can see in these yellow stripes are dry periods, drought periods where there's a very rapid um, and extensive drawdown of the water tables, which sometimes recovers and sometimes really doesn't recover very well at all, especially with increasing frequency of drought. So when you go to in urban environments, um, when, when we enter drought periods, we tend to see signs like this in little placards on the table, which tell you that um, whereas you might have been expecting your weight person to deliver you a glass of water, um, you're not going to get it from your server unless you ask for it. And as you're driving along um, on the freeway in Sacramento in this case, or in, in Los Angeles, you might see signs like this one warning you that we're in drought conditions. So really be cautious and think about your water use, especially outdoor watering. And then uh, an unfortunate consequence of the drought is that we tend to see worsening air quality over cities like LA um, because the rain that would normally um, fall and bring those uh, particles out of the sky, um, it, they're not there. So you tend to get an accumulation of smog in the environment. Now it's not all bad news in droughts. I mean, one really remarkable thing that happened in the drought in the 1970s is that people throughout um, LA drained their swimming pools um, and a, a clever group of surfers in Southern California recognized this as a, a fantastic opportunity to develop a, and a whole new sport. So this sport of, of sport skate, skateboarding um, really developed during the 1970s, um, during the drought conditions where there were empty pools all over the city of LA. And if you're interested, um, this is well documented within a, a, a movie called uh, Dogtown and Z-Boys, um, which is available from maybe one of the streaming services that you're already looking at in the evenings. Okay, so let's think about the recent California drought and what impact it had. These maps are from the Drought Monitor, uh, an excellent website that monitors drought conditions and specifies the spatial extent of droughts. And what we can see is that over the course of um, the years, it, looking in the springtime, we see this reddening of the signal of drought, which actually starts extending over the entire state into extreme or exceptional drought conditions. Um, by 2015, most of the state was affected um, and that caused all sorts of problems for water supply and water delivery. So when we look at a particular site, in this case, the Santa Clara River Basin in Southern California, these dots represent groundwater wells and each well has a historical record. I'm plotting a time series of one of them here during the drought, showing this progressive decline in the water table elevation. Everything in red indicates a water table drop of th greater than three meters. So there was extensive um, decline in water table elevations all over the place. <clears throat> and because rainfall was low in general, um, <clears throat> even plants that have shallow roots um, were affected. So these 
webcam images show you before the drought in April from a grassland in this region of the world. Um, and then in April in the heart of the drought showing the early browning and drying up of the landscape. Now let's zoom out a bit uh, and look more broadly over the California Central Valley and, and, other, and the surrounding areas. And you can see that in normal air years like 2002, we see a lot of green signature here. And that indicates a kind of good condition uh, where uh, a baseline condition of uh, water availability in the subsurface. We're talking about groundwater largely here. Um, but look, contrast that with what happened in 2014. There's a huge area of red here indicating a loss of water from pumping out of water that doesn't get replaced by groundwater recharge, leading to an annual loss of about five kilo, cubic kilometers of water per year over this brief period. Now, when you lose groundwater and surface water, um, what it tends to do is affects the plants as well. So we saw across the state um, a huge amount of canopy forest loss. So that's indicated in these uh, reddish and orangish colors. Um, so that's stress to the forest canopy, indicating less water in that canopy. Um, and plants have a way of responding to that by dropping branches, by dying completely, which isn't the best response for them. Um, but it makes the whole landscape a little bit more vulnerable. Vulnerable to what? Well, vulnerable for one thing, to forest fires. So wildfire can start in grasslands or in forested areas. This is an image that became quite famous from the recent drought period um, in near Paradise, California, where a wildfire spread very rapidly through a community um, and led to massive devastation of the entire city. So these were each one of these little plots was a house and it was completely destroyed. The entire area was destroyed. You may have seen um, a recent documentary um, on the BBC that, um, uh, that highlighted this, this event. So it's the, really the dry conditions that, that prime the landscape for this sort of event. Of course, the actual event was triggered by failed power lines, but the landscape was primed by drought. Okay, so let's step back and look at California as a whole um, in terms of precipitation. I apologize for the units here. This is just how the information comes across. Um, California has a, a dichotomy in the precipitation delivery. We tend to see uh, wetter conditions in the north and the west and progressively drier conditions in the south and the east. Now, that may seem similar to those of you who live in the UK, um, where in fact, if you look at the long-term average rainfall amounts, we tend to see something similar. The north, the, you know, Scotland and also the west, um, western areas, including uh, the Lake District and Wales, tend to be much wetter than um, the southeast. So that means that essentially um, the UK is also prone to drought conditions. And in fact, that's something that has happened more recently and is becoming a concern. So um, in 2017 and 2018, we recognized a big change in the amount of water level um, within reserv key reservoirs over the country. So um, these are uh, percentages of capacity compared with the same time in the previous year. And you can see really big drops in storage. Um, that led many people and, and many um, utilities, including Thames Water, to declare drought and, and to impose hose pipe bans, which are essentially um, a limitation on using water for watering plants. Um, washing windows or cars and filling ponds or pools. And that occurred over broad areas. Mm -hmm. Now, let's shift gears a bit and think about a different society. Um, in this case, um, <clears throat> we're thinking about East Africa and in particular, the Horn of Africa dryland environment. So this is a place in the world where water scarcity is it's intimately linked with food insecurity. 
And that's because most people are dependent on rain-fed agriculture and livestock uh, rearing, which means that each, each rainy season, they're expecting a certain amount of rain um, that will support the growth of their key crops, and they live on those crops. <clears throat> they raise their um, forage um, uh, uh, crops and feed their livestock with them. So when the rains fail, this can create major problems and ultimately food insecurity for huge areas of, of the land. <clears throat> In addition, there are people who are accessing water from groundwater wells. They might have to travel great distances to get access to that water. And that's the water supply for their own families, but also for their livestock. So when drought hits, um, it causes real problems. So this upper plot here shows in red all the droughts um, over um, the Horn of Africa in, in recent decades, um, showing that in, perhaps in, in recent decades, there have been many more severe droughts that are concentrated without having sustained periods of recovery from those droughts. And concomitantly, we tend to see an increase in the number of food insecure people through time. And that's because people are losing access to their basic water resources. Um, so when wells run dry, they have to have humanitarian organizations come in with water trucks to supply water to those communities. Um, and livestock tend to die off very quickly. So we see this sort of forecast quite frequently where large areas um, are are told they're going to see anomalously low rainfall for the upcoming season. <clears throat> and what that tends to do is it puts people on the move. They start scrambling to try to find the resources to cope with the situation at hand. Less water, less amount of forage for their animals, and, and not enough crop yield to support their families. <clears throat> now, um, if we think more broadly over historical time, we might realize that there have been great societies that grew up and survived within very dry environments, and quite successfully so. For those of you who recognize this picture, great. For those of you who don't, this is Wadi Rum. This is near Wadi Rum um, in Jordan. Um, and this is a very, very dry area, as you can see, with no surface water and very deep groundwater wells. Yet somewhere in a canyon near here um, that's called Petra, um, there was the development of a great society with artisans who had the time and resources to develop and create buildings that look like this carved into the rock. <clears throat> but they were only able to do so by coming up with very clever systems to move water around. In fact, they found water sources far afield, and their engineers designed canal systems to bring that water all the way into this remote canyon um, to support the Nabataean kingdom. Now, that's what I would call um, resilience and sustainability. Now, let's look at some more examples of resilience and sustainability from different societies and see how they're coping. So let's go back to California. As I mentioned, California has most of its water delivered in the um, northern part of the state. And, um, and there are many, many dry areas with huge population centers in the southern part of the state. So somehow that water has to move from north to south. Um, and in fact, that's essentially what was designed and what um, was developed over a period of multiple decades. Huge amounts of water um, are diverted from mountainous and wet areas in the northern part of the state to support agriculture. So greater than 50% um, of the water in California goes to agriculture. Also to support ecology in the form of wetlands and in-stream flows, but also urban environments, in particular in the southern part of the, of the state, where there's a lot less available surface water. 
So that system involves um, very large dams which collect water um, during critical seasons, for example, of snowmelt, um, and then subsequently deliver that water downstream. They deliver it through um, a complex system of pumps and um, aqueducts, including the famous California aqueduct, which travels several hundred kilometers from Northern California to Southern California, bringing water to the LA Basin and uh, the San Diego Basin um, through a system of gravity-fed um, uh, canals and also um, some pumping apparatus and, um, to, um, and pipe work to get the water over mountains and through mountains. So this is kind of a, a schematic or it's actually a map of, of the different key components in that water delivery system. The, um, you can see some of these reservoirs um, up in the, in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains, for example. Um, and then what you'll notice here is that there are a whole load of colored lines here representing different projects that were designed to move water from one place to another. And what's quite interesting indeed is that they're not all built by the same agency. In some cases, these are US government or federal um, infrastructures. In some cases, they're um, built by the state of California. In some cases, they're, it's a cooperation between the two. And in some cases, they're local entities that um, constructed these, uh, these facilities. So that really focuses on the surface water. But groundwater is also an, a key component to the system in California, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so this is a map of all the different groundwater basins within the state that are under some sort of risk of going dry. So the more orange they are, the more at risk they are. And you can see this broad area of the Central Valley is quite overtapped uh, in terms of uh, water pumping, or other ones might be a bit less. <clears throat> now, given that the, that's all, um, it, we we're in that state of play. Um, in 2014, there was the passage of uh, an act called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which led to, um, uh, which was signed by the governor, um, and it was essentially a cooperative agreement that transferred the power of management of groundwater resources from the state down to the local level. And the state is facilitating that process through interaction with those local groups, but also through the collection of information about the groundwater system within an online portal. <clears throat> So the essential goals of the Sigma Act were to essentially, um, uh, you know, mitigate for the lowering groundwater levels and the reduction of storage um, and the water quality, of course, um, to combat seawater intrusion in coastal zones in, in particular, um, <clears throat> to support new surface water supplies and groundwater recharge and to create more efficiencies in irrigation, and also to work on the demand side of constraining pumping and changing land uses and so forth. So the idea is that local communities, local groups of stakeholders, including farmers, but also municipalities and um, environmental groups would get together and, and hatch plans that would make the groundwater resources sustainable for the next 20 years. And then that, those plans would get approved by the state and um, with a system of enforcement. So one of the key aspects there is what we call managed aquifer recharge. And it involves taking a fallow uh, agricultural field like this one, flooding it with water, as you see here, and allowing that water to recharge into the unconfined aquifer, supporting a long-term sustainability of that aquifer. In the heart of the California drought, the governor of California, and this is the most recent drought, um, the governor of California directed its Water Resources Control Board to impose a 25% across the board reduction on the state's water supply agencies, which serve you know, almost all California residents. 
This was a really remarkable change and everyone bought in. There were a few violators, but mostly everyone went along with it. After the drought was over, that, the governor said, okay, we, that's not good enough. Let's sign some laws that require cities and water districts across the state to set permanent water conservation rules, even during non-drought years. In preparation for the next drought and our changing environment, he said, we must use our precious resources wisely. We have efficiency goals for energy and cars. Now we have them for water. So California created a, a, some sustainable infrastructure to deal with the impending uh, threat of drought. In the, in the Horn of Africa, you might think, well, they don't have the resources to plan and, and, um, uh, and become sustainable. But in fact, there are many resources and activities that are ongoing within the Horn of Af Africa that show a lot of promise. One of them is this, what I mentioned earlier, the Famine Early Warning System Network, which is um, linking climate information over seasonal forecasts to the risk of food security with it across the region. And that information is communicated to user bases of stakeholders to combat the risk. There are also localized measures that are being undertaken, including the development of sand dams. These are essentially managed aquifer recharge zones um, and irrigated agriculture that is done on a kind of fine scale, which doesn't actually waste water, but delivers the water where it's needed at the right time. And the development of new monitoring infrastructure um, that will allow farmers to see how much water they actually need to support the crop yield that they desire. Likewise, we see broad scale infrastructure development of um, sensors that are monitoring ephemeral rivers to determine when they're flowing and when they're not because that those are major recharge zones for groundwater. There are a whole network of groundwater wells, in this case in Somalia, um, <clears throat> that are telemetering the information and providing that back to management agencies. Then th there are local um, efforts within agro-pastoralist communities. Um, in this case, UEA has led up some work trying to find out from local communities about what sorts of decisions they make based on climate um, and how they make those decisions and what sort of information might be useful to them. And then on a regional scale, the organizations like the ICPAC are regional climate services centers that bring together huge groups of stakeholders across the region three times a year to provide forecasts and tell them what to expect in the coming months so that they can allocate resources and implement management and um, train people um, in terms of extension. And also they do modeling of um, the climate system itself. And then organizations like BBC Media Action are working with Kenyan agro-pastoralists to learn about their climate adaptation strategies and then making broadcasting those in the form of radio programs or TV programs to broad audiences to help them uh, learn from these examples. So let's step back to the UK for a minute and remember that the recent drought um, in southeastern England was a real fury. People were very upset and it was a major concern, particularly for the water firms. <clears throat> We saw a huge impact on the southeastern part of the state, um, and th there were all kinds of concerns about what the new future might look like in the UK. Now, I'm wondering about this in a sustainability context. Um, back in the early 70s, when there were a few droughts, there was something called the Water Resources Board. This is before Thatcher. This is before privatization of the water industry. They had drawn up plans to move water from north to south, from west to east and so forth, um, prompting um, then, Boris, then Mayor Boris Johnson in 2012 during the, most, the more recent drought to say, why is it not time to use the principle of gravity to bring surplus rain from the mountains to irrigate ref and refresh the breadbasket of the country in the south and east? Now, this might be a controversial statement. In fact, I'm sure it, it was and is, 
Um, and in fact, it's wrong because gravity um, doesn't operate from north to south. But nevertheless, um, it's a concept that perhaps deserves a bit of revisiting within the UK. Now, the real question that we have is, can we plan well to avoid day zero? You all remember the incidents in South Africa near Cape Town recently, where the reservoirs were running almost completely dry, and the entire water supply for a major metropolitan city was drying up. Well, let's not get caught flat-footed, um, leading to another sort of major crisis like the Dust Bowl. So just to conclude, the water cycle is not uniformly expressed across the globe. And that really creates regional challenges for human society. Climate change is driven by increases in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which induces a clear positive trend in global temperatures, yet highly spatially and temporarily variable changes in precipitation region by region. Many societies have faced cycles of climate controlled water scarcity, and they've developed and continue to develop climate adaptation strategies to cope and to create societal resilience to these cycles. We should expect high variability in changes to the water cycle in the future, affecting human access to water resources and food in both in wealthy countries and in developing nations. So what I say is, let's start it now. Thanks so much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot.